All right. So I just wanted to briefly introduce Dr. Terranova and then we will get started. Um, so Dr. Terranova received his Bachelor's of Science in Kinesiology from Penn State in 1999 and his Master's in Education in Sports Medicine and Athletic Training from the University of Virginia in 2001. He completed his Doctorate of Education in Kinesiology at UNCG in 2005, so he is a fellow alum. Uh, Dr. Terranova started his career as the head athletic trainer at the United States Merchant Marine Academy from 2001 to 2005, where he oversaw 18 varsity sports with approximately 800 athletes. Um, he also taught a course in basic first aid and a course in ship's medicine. At UNCG, he worked as the athletic trainer for wrestling, track and field, men's golf, and men's basketball. Uh, he's currently the program director for UNCG's Master's of Science in Athletic Training Program and the director of undergraduate studies for kinesiology. Uh, he still maintains clinical practice as athletic trainer for GTCC, Piedmont Tennis, SOCON Basketball, and various other organizations. And we are very fortunate and pleased to have Dr. Aaron Terranova with us today to talk about some medical myths, the things your mom told you that may or may not be true. So with that, I'll pass it off to you. Thank you so much, Aaron, and uh, take it away. Well, thank you, Beth, so much for that wonderful introduction. And thank you, everybody, for joining us for this lunch hour. Uh, a couple of disclaimers. Uh, I am from Massachusetts and I'm Italian, so I'm going to talk fast. I may talk loud and I'm going to use my hands. So if that's distracting, I apologize in advance, but that's how I was raised. So um, as Beth said, I'm a certified athletic trainer by trade and I teach a lot of my courses in my undergraduate uh we have something that's called Monday Myths, where every Monday I go over a fitness, health, medical myth that my students may have seen or been exposed to for their life. So I thought that'd be a nice little uh, thing to go over today. And I'm hoping that as I get going and kind of talk about some of these old myths that you may or may not have heard of, if anything pops up, if you're like, wait a second, my grandma used to do something similar, I want you to use the Q&A feature on this and pop it into the uh, Q&A as quickly as possible. We can go over them. I may not have an answer or I may. We're going to we're going to find out. OK, but we're going to start right now and hoping all this works. With just basic where I'm coming from and anyone in, who is in the health, fitness or medical field or maybe even other fields, we have something that's called evidence based practice. And that's that little middle white part on this Venn diagram. And what this is looking at is three sort of pods, clinical experience, which is what the clinician will have. And this is coming from a medical model. So appreciate that. The research, which you can see here in the red down in the lower left corner, and your patient preference in this sort of teal corner. And all three of these need to somehow come together to form a clinical decision or, or basically what you're going to base your decision on. And although this diagram has them as symmetrical circles, they're really not. Depending on what situation you're in, you may lean more to clinical experience over the evidence, et cetera. But I'm approaching today's talk. I'm kind of just coming right from this red research, okay? And maybe you as a person who's been exposed to some of these myths may be like, no, 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 no. I've done this for years and you're wrong. I don't care what the research says. And that's fine. We need to find sort of how you're going to interpret in and sort of filter through how you're gonna make a decision. And we kind of already do this on a regular basis, but when we look at the evidence, when I look at this red circle for today, there's a pyramid and the bottom of the pyramid is expert advice. And that's really the lowest level. We don't put a lot of stock into that, but the problem is it's the most common. You can see in the right here, all the different ways that we get quote unquote expert advice from Facebook and Instagram and YouTube and Snapchat. And I don't know, I think there's Reddit in there and TikTok. A lot of times information is coming to us through this quote unquote expert advice. And too many people may be actually utilizing this 
as the basis of their research. And that's not really what we do. You're going to see as we go through some of these myths, I am using more this blue and this green, systematic reviews, randomized controlled trials. Okay, so I'm going to be trying to show you evidence up at the top and not so much at the bottom of expert advice. And I'm hoping that can kind of go with it again. If you disagree with any of this, you're disagreeing with the science. Don't come attacking me and send me nasty emails. I'm just telling you what the science is saying. And we do this already in our everyday lives. We use evidence-based practice all the time, okay? So here's an example. This is a wonderful picture from 1980 of me in my Halloween costume because Halloween is coming up next week. And as you can tell, I am the cute one. I am, I am a R2-D2. That's my brother. He's C-3PO. Uh, my mom made that costume. That's actually a pillowcase that she just painted on. So that's what I'm dressed up as. Again, in Massachusetts, you have to wear snow pants in October because it, it was snowing. Um, but Halloween's coming up, and we already use evidence-based practice when it comes to picking our favorite Halloween candy. Okay? Now, for me, I'm a Reese's Peanut Butter Cup kind of person. Okay? That's just where I roll. All right? But that's a clinical profession. That's my personal preference. Now, you may be saying, wait a second, there's no such thing as evidence for best candy. And you'll be surprised there actually is. Now, candystore.com, which is at the bottom of that pyramid, okay, this is expert advice. They list the top 10 candies for Halloween. And look at that. My Reese's peanut butter cup is at the top. So if we actually put together our Venn diagram, my experience tells me I like peanut butter cups. My preference is for peanut butter cups, and the research says peanut butter cups. So I'm in the go here, okay? Now, if you said something like Charleston Chew, I would have to question why you even do Halloween in the first place, because nobody likes Charleston Chews. I don't know if they still make Charleston Chews, honestly, but like that would not be a good one. All right, so I'm hoping that kind of sets our stage of how we're going to approach with this evidence-based practice, okay? And maybe in your own life, besides using Halloween, you do that all the time. Say you're trying to pick a new car. You use evidence. You may use consumer reports. You may go to various websites. You try to get data on the car. That's one circle you use. You may also have experience with a car. I have always driven Subarus. I absolutely love them. They are my car of choice. That's my preference. And you may have experience saying, you know what? I also drove a Toyota once and it didn't go out well for me. So I'm not going to use that. Or it may be even more superficial. Your preference may be, I want green. I don't care what happens. I want a green car. Or I want a car that has good gas mileage. Or if my wife, a station wagon. Doesn't care. She wants a station wagon. Come rain or fire a station wagon. So again, we're overusing this in our everyday life. So let's look. We're going to dive in to our very first medical myth. And I don't know if anyone has seen this one before, but this is the infamous, if you are sick, put onions in your sock at night. And the idea here is that if you put the sock, the onion in your sock and you sleep overnight, you will wake up cured. You will no longer be sick. And I, I know this is a webinar style, so you cannot uh, raise your hand. But if you've seen this before, feel free to put it in the Q&A or the chat that you have seen this before. Okay? Here's the problem. It doesn't work. It works on something called the miasma theory, which goes way back. And this illustration I got from Wikipedia is that there are evil spirits in the air in the world, et cetera, in onions, potatoes, or other vegetables were designed to actually pull those spirits out of you, soak up the bad spirit, the bad air, and then you would be cured. And if you look at this article, this is from uh, American Academy of Pediatrics. So again, I'm up at the top of my little pyramid here. It actually looked at the use of folk remedies among children in urban black communities, re remedies for fever, colic, teething, et cetera. So if you want, you can actually look this article up. And they talk a lot about how certain cultures utilize these type of remedies when they were growing up. Why? Because these are typically very rural country 
um, areas that did not have a hospital. They did not have normalized health care as we know it. So they would have people who would travel from sort of settlement and area to area, and they would have in their pack roots, vegetables, whatever, potions, and they would travel. And they would use these type of medicinal, herbal, et cetera, as they go. And so that's kind of where this came from. So although the medicine, the science is saying this doesn't work, there's a very large cultural and patient preference for these type of folk remedies. And they are still around today. As a matter of fact, I, when I knew I was going to do this, I asked my graduate students, have you ever heard of this? And they said, oh, yeah, my grandma tells me all the time when I am sick, to put potatoes and onions in my sock and go to bed and you wake up. So this cultural and societal folk remedy is still very, very prevalent. So I don't know if you guys have done this, but save yourself, your significant other and your family, the wretched smell of onions and stop putting them in your socks at night. It's not, not going to do anything for you. And by the way, it can actually also kind of mess up the bottom of your feet. They look kind of nasty when you're done with it. So the next thing, this is a simple abrasion. If you are, I, I try to find a very gentle one. I didn't want to go too graphic here, but this is just a simple abrasion. And it begs the question, if this happens to you or if it happens to your kids, what do you do for this? How many of you go right to the hydrogen peroxide? You grab the bottle, yeah, that bad. You grab the bottle and you're like, oh, take this, and you put it on and you slap that right on the wound. And you're like, it's working because it foams. It does like the foamy thing. It works. Stop using peroxide. It's a myth because here's the thing with peroxide. This is coming from the National Athletic Trainer's position statement on acute skin trauma. I'm putting these references here for the very nerdy people who are going to go back and try to read this again. So if you want the references, I can give it to you. But here's the bottom line on peroxide. It is an antiseptic. No one's denying it. But if you look down here in the article, you can actually see where it says small experimental investigations support the findings that hydrogen peroxide is ineffective in reducing microorganisms in the wound bed. Moreover, it actually kills the good tissue. So when you actually get a cut, the first thing your body does is try to heal itself because the body's really good at that, okay? And then when you put peroxide on it, all that good tissue that's forming, the peroxide kills it. So it kills the bad stuff and the good stuff. So we don't use it anymore. So please stop using peroxide on fresh wounds. Now, if the wound may be getting infected, that's a different situation. I'm talking about a fresh wound. Little Bobby comes running in. Mom, I just scraped my knee. Don't use peroxide. What you use is this bottom part right here, normal saline or potable tap water. And you can see all the different researchers, all the different articles down here that say that potable tap water rates on infection and healing. Good evidence shows that you can get it just as good. All right. So potable tap water, normal saline, that's all you need. Please put away the um, the hydrogen peroxide. It is a good mouth gargle, but please stop using it on wounds. And the other part of an open wound, I'm going to go back a couple here. Okay, I'm going back to the scrape. Please stop telling people to air it out. Do not leave your wounds uncovered. You want to cover them. Um, Pam, I'm going to get to you in a second. So, yes, we no longer air out wounds. Keep them covered. As you can see in this one, it says dressings. It is well established that acute wounds should be covered with a dressing to support healing. Exposing them to the air just means you're going to get dirt, debris, etc. in the wound. And we don't want that. Clean and covered. Clean and covered. Remember nothing else. Remember clean and covered. And Pam, to your question in the chat, what about soap and water? That is perfect. That's what I would go with. Soap and water and cover that thing. So our second myth, are we going to use peroxide? No. Are we going to use soap and water? Yes. Are we going to air it out? No. We're going to put a Band-Aid on it, maybe some gauze on it. We're going to keep it clean and covered. The body actually likes warm, moist environments to heal. 
It's what we do best with. So let's keep the area warm and moist. And stop picking scabs. That's a different thing. I don't have evidence on that. It just creeps me out. Okay, so just stop doing that. So Pam, I hope I addressed your uh, question. I don't know if I have to answer live or type answer. I'm not sure how the format works, Beth. But Pam, I'm hoping I got you. Are we okay to move on to the next one? All right. You lose 50% of your body heat through your head. No, we don't. Stop that. That doesn't happen. Absolutely not. If that was true, you would able to you would be able to run around naked in the dead of winter just wearing a wool cap and you would be warm. That's not how it works. Okay, now here's the research. Where did this myth come from? It came from the 1950s, and I apologize for the typo there. It should say 1970. It came from the 1950s. That's where this first started. But it really gained popularity from the 1970 U.S. Army Survival Manual, and that's it. I tried to get a copy of it, but it was like $27 on Amazon, and I was like, forget that. But I can tell you what it said. They did this research back in the 50s on a bunch of Army uh uh, I don't think they were recruits, but uh, in the military. And what they showed was that these people are losing an astronomical amount of heat, about 40% of their heat through the top of their head. But when you look at the way they did it, all of the people they tested were submerged in ice water up to their necks. So the only part that was actually exposed to the air was the top of their head. So naturally, compared to water that's in an ice bath, compared to uh, compared to skin that's in an ice bath versus skin that is ex exposed to the air, absolutely, they were losing a ton of heat through the top of their head. The rest of their body was in ice. That somehow made its way into the U.S. Army Survival Manual. And just like that, and I have a picture of that's what they basically were testing. Just like that, it gets into our world our urban legend we have folk remedies for it and that's the thing grandma yelling at you put a hat on you lose 50 percent of the heat for the top of your head and i do not if there are any grandmas grandpas etc on this please do not come after me i am not trying to single you out i love you dearly okay but if this was true if we did lose uh all the heat from the top of our head we would just put a hat on and if we were able just to put a half on hat on and survive hypothermia, Jack would have lived. We just would have had to put a hat on Jack and he would have lived. But that's not what happened, is it? So you can blame Rose for a lot of things, like not having him on the door. But if Rose just put a hat on and this myth was true, he would have made it. But it would have been a completely different movie, I suppose. So. So I'm going to take a break here for one second. If you do have any comments, please put them in the chat. But I'm just going to take a quick drink. I don't want to be rude. Mm. And Beth, by the way, you're more than welcome to jump in here too because if you have anything that you've always wanted answered, now's the time. I just wanted to let you know this is this is blowing my my mind. Um, everything yeah. I know is wrong. I guess I don't. Yes. I don't know. Like what else? What else? have i have i believed my whole life that's wrong well here and, and beth this is the interesting thing about when you approach this from evidence but from the evidence-based model is i'm just giving you what the research says but you have a really big personal experience circle there which you can say look all i know is i put onions in my sock every time and i always feel better the next day I didn't put this one on here, but there's this one where if you wear wet socks, if you're if you're drinking alcohol and you put wet socks on while you sleep, you don't wake up with a hangover. The evidence will suggest that doesn't happen, but I know there are people who swear that is their hangover remedy. They put wet socks on, they go to bed, they wake up, no hangover. So how can you compete with personal experience? It's very difficult, um, especially if it's been passed down, passed down, passed down. You are not going to tell me that my grandma lied to me. That is not, no, no, you're not going to do that. Okay. She makes really good pumpkin pie and she would never lie to me. I get that. So the next one, staying with the cold theme, because I am from Massachusetts and it is October, which I have learned 50 degrees in October in North Carolina might as well be minus 500 degrees because 
it's you, you think it's cold. I'm I'm loving this weather. Don't go outside with wet hair. You'll catch a cold. I was told that all the time. You take a shower. You have to dry your hair. You can't take a shower and go outside. You'll you'll catch a cold. Yeah. So this is a a report uh, from University of Michigan. It's a survey. And I didn't get all the details on it, so I don't know on my triangle where it really falls. But it's interesting because they surveyed parents. How do they try to prevent colds in kids? Okay. And you can see this folklore strategy fits down there. 70% of the people who responded to this said that uh, you shouldn't be doing these type of things. And I believe it is the um, it's the bottom one right here. Many parents still believe in non-science folklore strategies for cold prevention, such as not going outside with wet hair. 70% of the people surveyed here still believe these type of folklores. Uh, it's interesting, this bottom one, 51% still say take vitamins. Vitamins have not been shown to prevent the common cold. So you can take all the echinacea, vitamin C, vitamin D you want. You're still going to get sick if you get sick. Because the fact of the matter is that little guy, which is the common cold virus, he's going to get you. And the way you get the common cold is you have to be exposed to the common cold. So if you have wet hair, you take a shower and you go outside and your hair kind of freezes and gets cold. If there's not a cold virus out there waiting for you, you're not going to get sick. You need the virus to enter your body to get sick. Cold, wet hair doesn't magically do that. That's the thing about a common cold. It's a virus. Um, so these are the type of things that we have to try to combat. I do like this survey, though. It does say 99% of people encourage personal hygiene. So wash your hands, avoid people who are sick, that thing. So those are good strategies. Like Continue to do that. When someone's doing this and wiping their nose and shaking your hand, you might want to avoid that behavior. But stop with the echinacea. Stop with, you can have wet hair. You're absolutely fine. I say that. I'm going to give Beth a little bit of a reprieve here. Because there is some evidence to the contrary. A little bit. Easy, easy. Okay. This I knew came out. Yeah, yeah, you didn't know it. But I like the, I like, I like the fact you're trying. This study came out in 2016. Um, it's from the journal Viruses. So they kind of know what they're talking about. A decrease in temperature and humidity precedes human rhinovirus infections in a cold climate. Uh, rhinovirus is the most common virus for the common cold. Rhino is nose like a rhinoceros has the horn on their nose. You hear rhino, think nose. So it's your common cold. And I took snippets of this article because I didn't want to put the whole thing there for you. Um, but you can see in this top paragraph, this middle paragraph right here, the second full, the second sentence, although controversial, scientific evidence suggests that inhalation of cold and dry air lowers the upper airways temperature and dries the mucosal membrane and may cause pathophysiological response that contribute to increased host susceptibility to viral infections. What does that mean? You go outside, the air is cold, it's dry. You felt that before, those cold, brisk mornings. You breathe in, that cold air goes in. It lowers the temperature. That dries out your nasal pathways. That drying out, then makes you more susceptible if there's a virus in the area to penetrate the body. Again, no virus, no sick. But if you're outside, you're with a group of people, et cetera, your mucous membranes are dried out, the virus is there, you can get sick. So that's what this bottom, the conclusions of this article are talking about. Our results, our results show that a decrease in temperature and absolute humidity, that's the AH, is absolute humidity, is associated with increased occurrence of H, H human rhinovirus. So there's a little bit of truth to, not the wet hair, the wet hair has nothing to do with it, but cold, dry air may physiologically allow you to be more susceptible to the virus. Doesn't mean you're going to get it because you still have to have the virus present there, but you may be more susceptible. So 
we want moist, more humid uh, air in a little bit higher temperatures. So I, I, mean, I gave you a little bit of a bone here. Okay. I didn't want to go completely negative on this. I try to help you guys out. Does that make you feel better, Beth? Just a little bit. So this is, this suggests that, that, I mean, it, it seems like common sense, but this is why people get sick more often in the winter, you would say. So why great, great follow-up. That was going to be my actual follow-up. We didn't plan this, but it's a really good follow-up. <laughs> people get more sick in the winter for a couple of reasons. One, the rhinovirus is abs is actually more common during that time. It just happens to the, the viral ebb and flow happens to peak during that time. The second thing is when it's cold outside, we tend to go inside. And when you're inside, you're just around more people, which means more contact with their various things. I lived like uh, I lived in New York for four years when I was at Merchant Marine Academy. You learn very quick not to touch anything on the subway because it's just it's a petri dish, right? But that's why in the winter time when we all go inside, we're doing this, we're touching something. Holiday parties are great because everyone's in like one room. They're doing this, they're wiping themselves, and then they're going into the the peanut bowl, right? Or they're touching something and you don't know. So there's just a lot more cross contaminations in the winter time. It just happens. So you have a you have a peak of the viral load. We get that, and just more proximity and more susceptibility to get the virus. Um, so that's that's there's a lot of factors that go into it, but that's probably the biggest one is we just go inside. And holiday parties are just a great way to get a ton of people in one area. By the way, I'm not poo-pooing holiday parties, but if you do need an excuse not to see family and friends this holiday season, you can use this evidence as like, no, no, no. Dr. T said I'm going to get sick from it. Okay, so you're welcome. Please don't say that. P please don't say that. Very helpful. Thank you. Yeah. All right. I'm going to move more into my world now. Ice reduces swelling. I love this one. Someone gets hurt, and the first thing we do, we got to get ice on them. Grab an ice bag. Someone get the frozen peas out of the freezer. We have to ice them down. Please stop. Please stop this. No. Uh, this article is from the World, the, Journal, the World Journal of Clinical Cases back in 2021, so it's fairly contemporary. And you can see their article. This is sort of their summary statement. Uh, I'm going to read the, therefore, of all the evidence on the negative of topically, topically means on top of the skin, icing injuries, it may reshape our thoughts and raise a doubt. And, and I'm going to sort of go back and give you context. When you put an ice bag on your ankle, if you sprain your ankle, that depth of penetration is minuscule. Okay. It is minuscule. It's maybe a couple millimeters at most. It certainly does not get down into the deeper tissues. So you're not icing the tissues you want to ice. You are icing very superficial or near the surface blood vessels, but we don't want to do that because blood vessels bring good things to the area. Much like the abrasion of the knee I showed earlier, we want the body to bring stuff. The body is very good at healing itself, people. We don't want to stunt or retard that. We want blood. We want things to the area because they're going to heal it. So what ice actually can do is constrict those blood vessels, not allow the good stuff to get there, and actually delay the time it takes to heal the ankle or whatever body part you are. The ankle is the most common one. So we need to be sort of careful about putting ice on immediately. Now, ice does have benefits. Not going to lie, it does have benefits. But the main benefit we get from ice, it's an analgesic. Okay, it numbs the area and decreases pain. That's why we like ice. And it's also very frustrating when we put ice on patients, they take it off after five minutes. You need to keep it on long enough to numb the area so the pain goes down. And if anyone's ever had ice, you know you go to various phases. It actually, it's cold then it burns, then it stings, then it hurts, and then finally it goes numb. And that could take anywhere between five to 10 minutes, depending on what type of application you have. So you have to keep the ice on long enough to actually numb the area to get the analgesic pain reliever. But if you think that ice on your ankle is gonna magically just reduce the swelling, it won't. 
in actual, what it's actually doing is preventing the body from naturally healing itself. So in my clinical practice, I've actually really curtailed the use of ice. Caveat for you athletes out there. This is for an acute injury. So this is not the same thing as cold tubs and immersion tubs, et cetera, after exercising and that type of stuff. So these are for acute injuries. I still do ice tubs after my long runs, okay? That is a different metabolic physiological thing there, okay? So don't conflate the two of them. But you don't need to keep running for the ice bag immediately. In fact, the best thing you can do is get compression on the area. They sprain their ankle, ankle put a compression wrap on them, get that leg elevated. That's going to be that your key. Pam's back again. Pam, I love you. Doctor and dentist say put ice on for 20 minutes and 20 minutes off to reduce swelling. So are doctors and dentists wrong? Yes. Um, they're, they're, you can get, yes, they're wrong. Um, I can't speak to dental, so I don't do a lot in maxillofacial. So I don't know if, if those, because the, uh, the blood flow is so much superficial, that may have an effect. Um, I don't think they're wrong for telling you to put ice on. I think, though, the idea that you're going to magically reduce your swelling with the ice is misplaced. I would still do 20 minutes on, 20 minutes off, but my goal would be the uh, pain reduction, not the swelling. So again, and I'm just telling you what the literature is telling me. <laughs> so Pam, if you have family who are doctors and physicians, don't come after me. But yes, um, it, it really doesn't work nearly as well as you think it does. And I'm hoping I got it. Beth is, and I don't know if you can see Beth, but Beth is shaking her head at me this whole time. Like I've just completely blown up her whole world. Um, again, I'm an athletic trainer. I still do use ice, but not in the same way I used to. Okay. Alcohol warms you up. And I'm using the classic St. Bernard with the little, like we all remember the Looney Tune cartoons where they had the little St. Bernard and it's full of alcohol. Alcohol warms you up. Yeah, it actually does the exact opposite. Um, so the left picture here is your skin. It's sort of a cross section of what your skin looks like. And you're going to know us here. You have what's called free nerve endings. You have a whole bunch of different nerves that, that can sense a whole bunch of different things. Touch pressure, vibration, uh, and you have you have ones that detect pain, heat, cold, et cetera. We tend to call those thermal receptors. They thermometer, they 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 test, they can sense changes in temperature. Well, they had this study came out. This is actually in the journal of alcohol. I did not realize that there was a journal called alcohol until I started researching this. But I was like, dang. So they looked at the effects of alcohol on thermal regulation, the ability for the body to regulate its temperature during mild heat exposure in humans. And this is, a, this is the abstract. I apologize for its length, um, but I wanted to get the whole thing in. So they investigated the effects of alcohol. Eight healthy men participated in this study. Um, experiments were conducted twice a day. The subject drank alcohol. Why couldn't I get in this study? Wait, why was I not in this study? Um, and you can see kind of what they did. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but the bottom here, it says there's an increased hot sensation. If you have drank alcohol, you do feel warmer, don't you? Like, ooh, I feel warm. Like, what is this sensation of, of heat? Um, what actually happens is that alcohol is a vasodilator. Uh, so your blood vessels go, whoop, they open up. When your blood vessels dilate, more blood goes through them because they're dilated. What also happens, I'm going to go back, is that blood vessel then from being way down here, it dilates, it becomes closer to the skin. And as the blood vessel gets closer to the skin, the, the body's like, well, I'm getting too hot. It actually starts to uh, dissipate the heat out because the body wants to stay at the same temperature. So if you have more blood, it's got to cool off. You've seen this when you exercise. When you exercise, look at your veins. Don't they come, your veins and arteries come to the skin, don't they? They become very prominent. Your body's trying to cool itself off by putting the hot blood towards the surface so it would cool off with the surface air. That's your body's very good at regulating, all right? So what alcohol does, 
it actually brings more blood to the surface. It starts cooling you off. And because these free nerve endings are right at the skin, as the heat leaves your body, it triggers the nerve endings. The nerve endings aren't good at detecting if the heat's coming in or going out. All they know is that they're being irritated. So what's actually happening is you're sensing heat leaving your body. You're actually ending up colder. So if you drink alcohol to warm up, you'll feel warmer. But in the long run, you're actually getting colder. You're actually dehydrating yourself and getting yourself colder and colder and colder. So, it, uh, I mean, there's nothing wrong with a hot toddy, uh, but when you're out of your fire pit tonight in the backyard and you're having fun, you're going to feel really, really warm the next day or when you get back in, you're actually making yourself colder, colder, colder. Beth, you are not happy right now. I can sense it on your face. Um but that's what's happening is you're actually just bringing the blood vessels closer to the surface and that blood is trying to cool itself off and you're triggering your thermal receptors near the skin. So you're actually getting yourself colder. I'm sorry. This is just, I mean, and, and I know you're from up North, so you're, you're, you obviously know a lot about the cold, right? Well, yes. I'm, I'm, I'm from right here. I'm from 30 minutes down the road in Winston-Salem and I, <laughs> I intensely dislike being cold. And one of my favorite things about having a drink around the holidays is it, I tell my, it warms me up a little bit, right? Yeah, it does. You've taken that comfort from me today. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. That's you also. deprived me of joy. In my... That's, that's one thing we tell. And uh, I tell my patients a lot is um, even though it's not hot outside because it's cold outside, Drinking alcohol can still dehydrate you. You can still actually have heat-related issues with alcohol in cold temperatures because you actually are continuing to dehydrate your body and actually drop your body temperature down. So, um, again, I mean, it, it's – I know you feel warm, you feel good. Um, but, yeah, luckily most people, when it's cold outside, are actually wearing clothes so the heat actually will kind of stay trapped a little bit. And obviously we have to wear a hat because we lose so much heat from the top of our heads. <laughs> um, so that's kind of what I had. I, I, I planned this to be like a 30 to 40 minutes and then I'm kind of here right now. Um, but I'm more than happy to go through any other things. I, I, I would really like some feedback from anybody else. If you have any other uh, folk remedy or anything else you've ever come across or something you're doing right now that you're kind of always – been doing your whole life i'd love to hear from you guys no offense i teach every day so me lecturing and talking i'm i don't need to be doing that again so i had the q a pulled up i'm trying to find it again uh, i have beth beth has been or pam sorry pam has been great to me pam has been has been doing great this whole time I mean, um, I could just call somebody out. I could call out, you know, I have a whole list of people here, but I, I won't, I won't this. do that. Yes. Yeah, so that was my last one. The, uh, the, the alcohol one was my last one. And yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, I have one about alcohol actually. Okay. Well, well we have, one, we have, you know what? I'll save mine until until you address this one that just popped in the q &A. All right. Does coffee actually warm you up? Um, you know, coffee's the same thing. Coffee's a vasodilator. Um, it does the same thing. So the the thing about coffee is we typically drink it at a hot temperature. I take that back. We have iced coffee now. I have never had a cup of coffee in my whole life, so I don't know the sensation of alcohol gives you. Um, but yeah, it's the same thing. It dilates. It brings your blood vessels there and um, but typically hot coffee will warm you up just because the temperature is hot. Uh, tea, same thing. All of these are vasodilators. So they're all going to do the same thing, right? Uh, the temperature is going to warm you up. Yes, but, uh, you're going to probably end up feeling cold. So yeah, that's, that's kind of what it comes down to. VIX is a cure. -all. Oh my gosh. Okay. We're going to talk about the VIX one. All right. Rosalind, if you don't mind, I'm going to sidebar VIX for a second. Cause this is a great one. Um, stop rubbing out, stop putting rubbing alcohol on children for, for fevers. Please stop doing that. Okay. If you've ever been told to do that, you would put like, you take uh, isopropyl alcohol 
put it on like a cotton swab, and you would swab the whole body. Or worse, you would dunk children in isopropyl alcohol baths. Please stop doing that if you're doing that. One, you're actually not going to cool. What actually happens is the alcohol evaporates on your skin. And again, those thermal receptors sense the evaporation as cooling. You're actually not doing anything for core body temperature. And two, isopropyl alcohol is very easily absorbed through the skin. So there are children, I'm not laughing, but there are children who have gotten alcohol poisoning from absorbing alcohol through the skin. So please discontinue isopropyl alcohol through the skin. VIX works in the same thing. Okay, VIX doesn't have the same alcohol content, but it's the same idea. doesn't do anything. It does a little bit of vasoconstriction, a little bit, but it really doesn't do anything to drop your core temperature. Um, so yeah, I, my wife uses vapes. She puts it on my kid's chest when he has a fever, but it really won't do anything to drop the temperature. The fever is going to just have to run its course. So Aaron, I use, I use VIX on, on my kid um, when he's having trouble sleeping because he's congested. And I feel like that's the only use I've ever been told. Yeah, yeah, it's the same thing. It's more of a sensation sensation thing. It really, and I'll be honest though. So Rosalind and Beth, I don't di I don't know a ton about the evidence on this. So I'm talking a little bit of ignorance here. But if you want, I can research VIX. But my experience has that been because the congestion is a systemic issue, your body's actually having a physiological response. It's making histamine. It's making all these different chemical reactions, et cetera. That superficial transdermal is not actually going to stop that process, mm -hmm. right? So that's really not going to do anything for you. Um, right? the, the, that is different though. So my wife, I'm calling my wife out here. So if she's on this, she's going to kill me. My wife loves neti pots. If you've never used a neti pot, that's when you stick the thing in your nose and you do like this and it flushes out your nasal. That's different because that's actually a mechanical modality. We actually will go and actually move, physically move mucus, et cetera, out your nose. There's a whole bunch of things you got to be careful with that. Um, but, but yeah, VIX, yeah, I'm not, my wife likes it. I think my kid likes it because he likes the smell. I don't, I don't know. Um, Epsom salts for sprains. Oh, oh boy. Okay. Um, I don't know. I honestly don't know. I'm going to write that down. I'm going to get back to you on that one. I don't know about Epsom salts for sprains. I believe the idea, and if there's someone here who can talk, I believe the idea of the Epsom salt, it actually drops the temperature of the water a little bit to try to increase cold temperature. Again, going back to ice, I believe that's how it works. We do the same thing. Some people drop acetone into water or into ice because acetone will drop the temperature even more dangerously low. It actually will, will damage skin tissue. So let me get back to the Epsom salt. I don't know that one, but I will, I will find out. If you want to email me your email, because I don't want to put it out here for the world to see, you can email me and I will get you an answer coming back. Chicken soup, yeah, it's the same idea. Chicken soup is good. It won't cure the cold because, again, it has nothing to do with the virus. But chicken soup has a lot of good things. One, it has sodium. And a lot of people who are sick tend, typically are dehydrated, right, because you're using so much energy to fight off the virus. You actually sweat more than you think. You actually use a lot of energy. So you get good sodium, so you can replenish that. has protein with the chicken, vegetables. So chicken soup is just a good, easy thing to drink. It also is very easy in the digestive system. Broth is really easy. So even if you have an upset stomach, you can handle broth. So yeah, chicken soup won't do anything for the virus, but it will help your body get energy and food back into the system to fight off the virus. Um, sidebar conversation, which I've done a lot. Uh, if you do have the common cold, stop going to the doctor. They're not going to give you anything. Okay. They can't give you antibiotics because they common cold is a virus. Antibiotics don't do anything for that. Um, so you'll be better off just doing what we call suppressive therapy, orange juice, chicken soup. Just take care of yourself, but save yourself the copay. 
The doctor's not going to give you anything for it. Um, Listerine to combat germs in the mouth. Oh, I, I read an article last year on this that there's actually a big debate because a lot of these products actually dry out the mouth and it actually makes it worse for it. I got to get back. To, I'm going to put that one down too. I don't know enough about Listerine or all the other things to give a good evidence. I'm going to look at this one too. Again, Pam, if you want to send me your email, I'll be more than happy to look up for that one, but I don't know that. How about putting warm clothing on your head for a headache? A, uh, okay, no, no, no. Uh, Rosalind, I love what you're doing there. Yeah. Um, unless you want to make a fashion statement. Uh, no. Um, the one thing that is kind of interesting about this, and it's it's not always related, um, is we are a very tactile, we like tactile feel, Right. So even if you have an upset stomach, this will bring back a memory for me. When I have an upset stomach, one of my memories is lying on my like lying down on my mom's lap and she would just kind of stroke my head. Stroking my head has zero physiological with my stomach, but the tactile sensation does give a bit of a little bit of an endorphin release, and that endorphin can actually make you feel better as a whole. So no, that's not going to do anything for you, but the tactile sensation may make you feel better. But I will say this, if you have a stomach ache or potentially food poisoning, lie on your left side, okay? When you lie on your left side, your stomach and your intestine are at a 90 degree perpendicular angle and you want poison, et cetera, to stay in your stomach because your stomach has acid, battery acid, basically, and it eats and destroys all that stuff. You don't want it to go into your intestine because your intestine's sole job is absorption. So then the poison gets absorbed back into the body. So if you're sick, et cetera, lie on your left side. Keep the contents in your stomach so they can be broken down better. Don't lie on your right side. Go on your left, not your right. So quick sidebar. So if you may have had too much alcohol because you wanted to warm yourself up, lie on your left side you won't get as sick. Not that I wouldn't know that. Um, <laughs> heat pads do work for cramps. It does depend on the type of cramp, but what actually happens, the heat actually does penetrate enough, depending on what, what you're trying to heat, uh, to stimulate what we call the Golgi tendon organs in the muscle spindle, and they actually do become relaxed. So heat actually does have a physiological effect on cramping. Again, it depends what kind of cramp it is. There's like, you know, musculoskeletal cramping, menstrual cramping, abdominal cramping. It kind of depends where it is, but there is good evidence that heat will help with that. So what about um, like, like you've got, you've got your shoulder hurts. Mm -hmm. If you put heat on it, does that, does that help? Again, that may depend on the type of injury. If it's like a deep muscular injury, probably not because muscle is much more deeper. It won't penetrate deep enough. But again, I do this. Placebo is a real thing. Heat makes people feel better. You get in a nice hot tub, a warm tub, et cetera. You just feel relaxed, right? So there is a bit of an endorphin and Keflin release where your body just feels better. It may not physiologically get enough to actually impact the muscle because it's too deep, but you will get a release. I do use moist heat in, in some of my modalities. And Marty, ginger ale for the stomach or ginger for the stomach. Um, there is... And I know this because I love ginger ale. It is my drink of choice. Um, there is some limited evidence of the efficacy of ginger with stomach issues. Um, a lot of that, they, they, I haven't read a research study that said, is it the ginger or is it the carbonation from the, the soda that's doing it? But there is some limited data for it. Um, I do drink ginger ale when I have a stomach ache, so I'm glad you put that up there. Again, it's my go-to. Um, but the data is kind of <clears throat> on that. So Marty, this would be more of your experiences. Ginger ale works. Use it. If, if you think it works and it works for you in the past, by all means, go for it. I would recommend uh, Canadian uh, Canada dry. That, that's my go-to. I don't do Schweppes. I do Canada dry. That has nothing to do with anything though. That was kind of, I like that. That was rapid fire. So I'm hoping I got through everybody. And um, 
I don't know where I can post my email if anyone wants my email. Uh, I put it in the chat. Oh, okay. Yeah. So please feel free to email me. I'm 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 totally available. I like I said, I love doing this stuff. I do have my oh. undergrad classes, so a lot of fun. We actually have a um a message that came through the chat. Um, uh -oh. a lot of young moms swear by essential oils. Uh, is that helpful or not? No, please stop using essential. Okay. Um, essential oils, crystals, magnets, all that kind of stuff. I'm going to, I am grouping them together and I apologize if, if, if I group them together like that, you got to be careful with them. They probably won't do any harm probably, but they may not be as beneficial as you think. Um, essential oils really works on, on premises that haven't been really well founded, much more holistic chakras, meridians, very similar like foot reflexology, hand reflexology, that type of stuff. Um, I'm coming from a very sort of Western evidence section for this talk. Uh, so again, I don't think they're going to do a lot of damage. I think there have been documented cases where people have inappropriately used essential oils and actually injected them or inhaled them improperly. So I obviously wouldn't, wouldn't want to do that. But yeah, I don't think they have nearly the benefits you do. I and it's you say uh, young moms. My dad went on a magnet kick when he when he developed osteoarthritis, um, and he was like swearing by these magnets. And it took me a while. He was spending way too much money on them. I was like, Dad, like just please stop doing it. So I actually bought him a sham magnet for Christmas, and I told him to wear it. I said it's the best one on the market. Uh, and it gave, I actually made up a fake report about it and I gave it to him and I called him a week later. I was like, how do you feel? He's like, this is the greatest thing ever. That's when I told him it was completely fake. So I had to trick my dad who I love more than anything, but um, I had to get him off the, uh, had to get him off the magnets. I know a lot of baseball players and professional athletes wear it, but it doesn't, it doesn't do what you think it does. I had a, a situation where I put um, peppermint oil in uh, in in a bathtub. Um, yeah, yeah. For, for my child when he was very young, because um, because I was talking to a, a nurse that I happen to know about it, and um, she said it would help with with his like stuffy nose. Yeah, and it was oh. it was not good. Yeah, a lot of these come out again of that uh miasma like that old folklore like they come roots and herbs that now don't get me wrong herbs roots plants huge medicinal purposes they do have medicinal purposes but we have seen with a lot of people as they said well if we just take it and like put it in an oil it has to do the same thing and it doesn't always work that way when you change the composition of certain structures it changes its interaction with organisms in the body so they, they, there is a little nugget of, of a granule of truth in a lot of these, and they've kind of taken it and, and went with it for profit. Um, but no, I, and I'm not trying to completely disparage. There is a lot of very good medicinal and herbal medicine, et cetera. Just you have to make sure that it's well-founded and, and well-used, right? Um, I mean, my mom used to use aloe for burns. Aloe does have documented properties for soothing burns, et cetera. Not open burns. Do not use them on open burns. Oh, yeah. And don't use butter. Never put butter on an open wound if you guys use that one. You're just going to smell like a bakery. And you're actually going to be introducing more pathologies and toxins into the body with the butter. You're at, you, and, and fat, in case you didn't know this, fat is an insulator. And butter has a lot of fat in it. So you're actually trapping heat in the wound, in the burn. Like you want the burn to cool off. You put it in a layer of fat there, you're actually trapping heat in the burn. You're actually going to continue to let the burn kind of be hot. So stop putting butter on burns, if anyone's ever done that before. Please stop that. And I look, if you get good research articles that show I'm wrong, I am the first person to say, cool. I'd love to read about it. I love learning about things. So I'm just telling you what I have read. And if there's something better out there, by all means, bring it over to me. I'd love to read about it. So I don't know how we're doing for time, but I think I hope we got everybody. Yeah, I think we uh, I think we've taken care of all the questions in the Q&A as well as that one in the chat. Um, 
is there a hand raised? Am I seeing that? Did I miss something? Uh, so Pam asks, what should you put on burns? Uh, Pam, it does depend on the type of burn. And I am not a firefighter, so I, I don't want to misconstrue anything. Um, for most burns, let's assume they're not uh, open in like a third degree where you have a lot of necrosis and cell death, et cetera. But for most burns, uh, a damp, um, uh, a damp compress, a, a moist, cold compress would be just fine. Again, if it's open, you want to get that covered with a, a sterile band or something because you don't want dirt and stuff in there. Um, but if you have like a sunburn, just put like a damp washcloth or a damp, com cool, damp compress on it. You're trying just to cool the, the temperature down on the body and you can do it that way. But don't put any oils or uh, bombs or anything like that. You don't want to be putting a bunch of stuff on there. Like that just is going to, A, you're going to risk getting debris and junk in there that you don't want. And if you do actually have a pretty severe burn, you're going to get there. They're going to have to debris and clean all that out anyways at the hospital. And, and you don't want to be a part of that. It's actually, it's actually being very painful. I don't, what's SL mom. I don't know what that is. Vix massaging the chest for congestion. My mom did damage with mass. Do not, no, 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 don't go there. I am not going to be, I am not going to be held accountable if you're, if, for your mom. That's a you and your mom thing. You, you're going <laughs> to, Thanksgiving is coming up. I'll let you guys talk about that over Thanksgiving. I hope this is helpful, people. I hope you got a little bit out of it. And if nothing else, when you hear about these things, just turn a critical eye to it and just maybe, you know, talk about it and see, you know, is it really worth it? Especially if it's a really expensive thing. Like I'm paying $500 for this magnetic bracelet, which is going to cure everything. Probably not. Probably not. But this has been extremely helpful for me. Um, and also um, pretty distressing, you know, just from a, a personal knowledge level. So, um, and I, I can say, I think you're very trustworthy and I knew that you, you were, when you revealed your um, your high esteem for Reese's peanut butter cups, so uh, the best one out there, <laughs> clearly and empirically, right? Absolutely. Well, my next door neighbor is a pediatric dentist, so he gives out toothbrushes. So it's very like the student, the, the kids when they trick or treat, yeah. they stop at his house. They don't come to our house anymore because they get they get their toothbrushes. <laughs> Just offset it, you know. Yeah, I try. Well, um, thank you so much, Dr. Terranova. This has been wonderful and we have so enjoyed this. I'm sure I speak for everyone on the call, but um, we're, we're very, we're very appreciative you were able to come and talk to us today. So thank you. No worries. Thank you, everybody. You have a great rest of the day. All right, everyone, I'm going to go ahead and end this recording and we will ha we'll have it available for anyone who registered and was not able to attend uh, thank you all for coming and keep an eye on your email for uh, more all access sessions. Thanks, everyone. Let's stop recording.